My name is Whitney Bauman. I'm an assistant professor of religious studies here at FIU. Um, I'm also the new program director for the program in the study of spirituality, which is uh, one of the co-sponsors of this event tonight. We're also co-sponsored by the Center for Humanities in an Urban Environment, uh, by the Religious Studies Department, and by WPBT Channel 2. Right, who is filming this tonight, and uh, at, the, uh, at some point in the not-too-distant future, um, this will be uh, cataloged on this, the website of the Center for, Humanities, Center for Humanities in an Urban Environment. So you'll be able to find this lecture there. Um, so we're very thankful for WPB, WPBT2 for filming all of these events for us um, in a very professional way. Um, just a few advertisements. So in case you don't know, let me just tell you what the mission of the program in the study of spirituality is. It is to explore the nature and qualities of spirituality, including its traditional context and contemporary applications. And, and in order to, so we're looking at sort of religion outside of where you would normally look for religion is what we're trying to do. So we look at uh, spirituality of atheism, for instance. Um, spirituality in the environment, spirituality and medicine, spirituality and business, so on and so forth. Um, how, are, how is spirituality being conceived of in, in ways that are outside of one of the um, sort of traditional world religions? Um, and that is the, the aim of the program. We have a certificate program and this series of events, um, which this is part of tonight. Out, on the outside table you'll find all of our paraphernalia. We have uh, the rest of our events listed on this card and also a little brochure that describes more about who we are. So, um, I'm also sending around a sign-in sheet if you would like to get on our listserv, um, and that way you will find out about events that we have in the future. So, all right, I think those are all the um, advertisements. And now I want to uh, introduce you to our speaker tonight, um, who it is my great pleasure to introduce to you. Um, Professor Richard Kearney holds the Charles B. Sealing Chair of Philosophy at Boston College and has served as a visiting professor at the University of College Dublin, the University of Paris, the Australian Catholic University, and the University of Nice. He's the author of over 20 books in European philosophy. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot, I'm just going to say. Um, he is a um, former member of the Arts Council of Ireland, the Higher Education Authority of Ireland, um, chairman of the Irish School of Film at the University of College Dublin. Um, he's also a public intellectual. Um, I learned today in our conversation that he's not just um, a, a, philo a philosophical sort of uh, sitting in the, a philosoph philosophy professor sitting in the ivory tower, but he's also a successful novelist and a poet. And he's friends with Bono, so, you know, uh, <laughs> Professor Kearney has a, has a very uh, interesting and rich uh, history and past, and I'm thrilled that he's here um, to, to speak to us tonight. He's a true scholar, um, and, a, and, a, and a true well-rounded person as well, um, as well as being a good scholar, which is hard to do. <laughs> um, I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, well, either of them really, but, <laughs> okay. So, by way of introduction, I just want to read you um, the first, uh, the first uh, couple paragraphs here in his book, Anatheism, Returning to God After God. Um, and I use this book in a, in a graduate course in religious studies, um, and that's how I found out about Professor Kearney in the first place. When you become a teacher, it's the best way to learn. So, um, All right, so he writes, What comes after God? What follows in the wake of our letting go of God? What emerges out of that night of not knowing, that moment of abandon, abandoning and abandonment, especially for those who, after ridding themselves of God, still seek God? That is the question I wish to pursue in this volume. And so doing, I propose the possibility of a third way beyond the extremes of dogmatic theism and militant atheism, those polar opposites of certainty that have maimed so many minds and souls in our history. This third option, this wager of faith beyond faith, I call anatheism. Anatheos, God after God. Anatheism, another word for another way of seeking and sounding the things we consider sacred but can never fully fathom or prove. Another idiom for receiving back what, we're given, what we've given up as if we're encountering it for the first time. 
just as Abraham received back Isaac as a gift, having given him up as patriarchal project. In short, another way of returning to a God beyond or beneath the God we thought we possessed. So you're in for a real treat tonight, and without further ado, um, I give you Richard Kearney. Thank you very much, uh, Whitney. I think that quote sort of says it all. I can go home now. <laughs> I have a huge amount more to offer in terms of argument. But I hope to apply that argument or claim that was just uh, repeated and rehearsed by Whitney from my book uh, by way of um, art and poetics tonight. Just as Whitney was saying in this series, you know, spirituality applied to medicine, ethics, nature, environment, business, whatever. Well, tonight I'm applying it to poetics in the broad sense of the word, as understood by Aristotle when he wrote the poetics two and a half thousand years ago. It's the art of poesis, of making, of creating. So I'm going to take some examples from literature and some poets and painting. Uh, to illustrate this, what I call, wager of anatheism. But first, a word about uh, the term itself. Um, as the quote just suggested, it's not theism and it's not atheism, understood as positions or dogmatic positions uh, that form an opposition that very often leads to a dialogue of the deaf and no real advancement. So anatheism is saying, after the, uh, after the errors of the dogmatic theism of sovereignty, um, and after the dogmatic denunciation of that God, can there be a space that opens up where the divine may return? In other words, can there be a God after God, which may well be the oldest God in the world, Judeo, Christian, Hindu, whatever, returning in a new way. Now the term ana in Greek, as we find it in anamnesia, analogy, anagogy, you know what those words mean, don't you? The ana there is, is, means a kind of a, a, a repetition. Um, the word, as defined in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, is up, back, again, and you in time and place. So get your head around that one. But lots of um, adverbs and adjectives there, and the ones that interest me most are back and and you. So that the God after God is a returning to God and returning again and you. Returning to God after the death of God, and I mean the death of God in two senses. The loss of God in terms of any existential experience that one may have. What the poet Hopkins, the, the Jesuit poet Hopkins, Hermann Hopkins called um, uh, the, the night of letting everything go. The dark night of the soul, as John of the Cross and the mystics call. Everybody probably has experienced something like that. It may go by the name of depression, or despondency, or despair. Um, but it's waking in the middle of the night and just feeling that everything is gone, lost, meaningless, including God. Uh, so that out of that, if we can learn to work through that, in what Keats, the poet Keats calls negative capability, I'll return to this in a moment, there may be a space that opens up for the return of the sacred, of something sacred. Uh, in a second sense, I mean, that's the existential, everyday sense, just as Heidegger says we all experience angst, but that's the condition of our being in the world, and this is taken up by Sartre and de Beauvoir, and of course the entire existentialist tradition. Um, I think there's something very true about that in relation to uh, the divine, I God, as well as in relation to being. Heidegger and Sartre talk about it in relation to being, this experience of angoisse, angst, angst, um, anxiety, depression, loss. 
Uh, but I think it can equally be applied to the experience of God. And very often philosophy, being is a word, is a secular word for the ultimate, the absolute, the universal, the profound. But in a second sense I mean it too, and here it is more particular to the age in which we live. Uh, that is to say, post-religious, post-secular, post-enlightenment, post-French Revolution, post-Marx, Freud, Nietzsche, all of whom in their different ways and for different reasons, um, announced the death of God. Post Weber, what Weber called Entzauberung, the uh, de-magification, uh, Entzauberung, of uh, our secular, modern, industrial, capitalist world, which is now our global condition. And there may be a new Cold War brewing, but I can assure you the values of Putin, um, Russ Putin, they're the same. They haven't changed, and they're not that different in terms of secular economic priorities. Uh, they may be in terms of territorial claims, but in terms of a global secular culture, we're all in it in one way or another. So, this is particularly accentuated, of course, in the West, and uh, I want to take that seriously, that that culture of secular humanism, as Charles K. Taylor calls it in his recent book, A Secular Age. Uh, it's called, he goes through different kinds of secularism, but an exclusivist humanist secularism, that there is nothing beyond the secular. Now, what I'm trying to suggest is that within the secular, we can find the sacred. That it doesn't have to be the old opposition. You either choose secular humanism or you choose some absolutism. That the secular and the sacred can actually come into some creative relationship. So that's the wager. And therefore the God after God is a God, i.e. the anagod, the anatheos, and that is the God of what I'm going to call the stranger, as opposed to the God of sovereignty, the God of power and might, the God of theodicy. That God is gone. But can there be the God of the strange and the stranger that returns, that's my question this evening. So I'm going to look at anatheism, specifically in relation to the religious imagination, and to do so, as I mentioned earlier, in relation to uh, some poets and some painters. John Keats talked about negative capability, and he said the poetic condition is to be able to find yourself radically disposed towards the strange. I quote, negative capability is when you find yourself in mystery, uncertainty or doubt without the least hankering after fact or reason. In other words, staying in the mystery, uncertainty and doubt, right? staying in the cloud of unknowing, as one of the mystics called it. Staying in that moment of radical openness to what may come. Keats actually said that when you're in this uh, condition of negative capability, you, you forfeit and bracket and suspend all your preceding certainties and attachments and addictions and presuppositions and prejudices and you look at the world as if you are living on the first day of creation. And he called it a willing suspension of disbelief. But you could add a willing suspension of belief. One enters into a condition which is, uh, here I quote another poet, André Gide, another writer, um, in Disposition, moins une attente qu'une disposition à l'accueil. It's less an expectation than a radical disposition to receive whatever comes. So that's negative capability. And that's the first step of anatheism. It's letting go of everything. It's the moment of abandon and abandonment. But sometimes can be lived in, in huge anxiety and, and fear. Uh, and despondency, the dark night of the soul, or the Janus face of that is this moment of 
radical opening up towards something that may come. So that's the second moment, the turn towards that which may come, or may come back. It may be a returning to that which already was, but has died, and is now coming back. A movement, by the way, that you find in every spiritual wisdom tradition. Letting go, abandonment, and then it comes back. In my own Christian tradition, and I'm not invoking this in any supersessionist sense, simply the one I know, um, or know best, uh, very committed to interreligious style, but it's the one I hail from, one finds, for example, in the uh, crucifixion, uh, Jesus Christ abandoning and being abandoned by the Father, the God of theodicy, the God of power and might, who supposedly might come down and take him off the cross. But of course, he realizes that that God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That God of power and might, of theodicy, doesn't exist. And then, having said adieu to that God, Abdeo, Abdeo, adieu, he says adieu in the sense of come back, I'm coming to you, unto the echo of my spirit. And that's the ad Deo. There are two A's in anatheism. The first A is the A of abstention, abandon. Um, the second is the A of Advent and Arrival, and the two are extremely important. To play with the words, and I don't want to do it too much, are the letters. AA is also the name of a, step, of a 12 step program, in which there are 12 steps, but the two most important are letting everything go and acknowledging one's total helplessness before one's attachments and addictions. And secondly, uh, the second A is that of uh, abandoning yourself to what's called a higher power, however you define that power. But there's the letting go of the old God and then the uh, opening up towards uh, another God. Um, and remarkably, many people are healed and cured by virtue of this double A. I mean, the word literally means alcoholics anonymous, but I'm playing on the double A. The double adieu. So much then for Keats and this negative capability as a radical exposure to the strange that is at the source of poetic astonishment, wonder, and a sense of the sacred. Uh, the strange is that which is unknowable, secret, sacred, secret and sacred at the same root, of course. And that comes from the Greek, sacer in Latin comes from the Greek mysterion, which literally means a blindfold, not knowing. So being in that position of not knowing, uh, this kind of exposure may prompt us to begin all over again, to surrender inherited sureties and turn towards the other in wonder and bewilderment, in fear and trembling, in fascination and awe. So at this moment, the inaugural space of poetics, the poetics of the sacred and of religion, are basically isomorphic or similar. A second poet I want to quote before moving on to the paintings is Jared Manley Hopkins, a Jesuit uh, poet who lived much of his life in Ireland uh, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, a poet who invites us to see the sacred in our everyday experience. What he called hechaitas, the thisness of things. He's taking it from Don Scotus, a medieval philosopher and medieval monk. And hechaitas is the idea that in the particular singular thisness of a person, a thing, um, an object, an event in nature, uh, one can see the divine. If one has been uh, purged of one's prejudices and presuppositions which blind us to seeing this, it's there. 
in the particularities and singularities of everyday experience, the epiphanies of the everyday, as he put it. And he himself called the practice of sacred poetics a practice of aftering, seconding, over and overing, abiding again by the bidding of the everyday. It's a quote from his journal. Now what interests me there is the connection between Anna and aftering. It's a verb, he, it's a neologism, he invents it, aftering, overing. Secondly, that you come back to your experience poetically, and instead of taking it for granted, you retrieve it, revisit it, and see it in you. You go back to it to see it in you. This is the act of religious poetics. I quote again the definition of the prefix Anna in the Oxford English Dictionary, up in place or time, back again in you. And place and time are very important. It's a particular place, it's a particular time. These designate, right, overing, seconding, aftering, these designate for Hopkins a process of retrieving the divine in a world ostensibly estranged from God, and therefore recovering the sacred in a time of disenchantment. This is one reason why Charles Taylor, in his great book of Secular Age, cites Hopkins as an exemplary instance of how the sacred can resurface in a secularized universe where God's existence is no longer taken for granted. Hopkins felt that this dialectic of loss and return in his very bones, it was a personal spiritual matter, not just an intellectual cultural matter. You know, we're living in a post-enlightenment, post-French Revolution, um, uh, secular industrial age. He felt that too, and wrote poems about it, Piers Plowman being one of the most famous, but he felt it in his bones. He suffered from huge depressions, huge dark nights of the soul. And he recorded this in a whole series of sonnets called the Dark Sonnets. I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. No worse there is none. Carry in comfort. And many others. Here's one line from I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. Oh, the mind, mind has mountains. Sheer, frightful, no man fathomed. Hold them cheap, may those who ne'er hung there. But there's probably few of us who hold them cheap, because we probably all hung there at some point in our lives, on those sheer, frightful, no man fathomed cliffs, with nothing but the abyss beneath us. One doesn't have to be a depressive or, an, or a um, melancholic to have woken and felt that fellow dark, not day. So the first A of anatheism, the A of abandonment, is not one confined to philosophers like Heidegger talking about angst, or the great mystics talking about the dark night of the soul. It's something, I would argue, that everybody has experienced at some point in their lives. We are all eligible for anatheism. The second A, of course, is another matter, and that's when we come to the wager as to how we review, revisit, return to the world after the moment of, and in the moment of, abandonment. Christ could have decided to stay with the first line, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, and died, and gone, as we're told in the Gospels, uh, into hell where he spends three days. He could have left it at that. But he decides to make the second move, which is a wager, a choice, which he's free to do, and to say, okay, I've, I've now let, let go of the old God who would have come down and saved me from the cross, would have come down and saved the Jews in Auschwitz. And as Elie Wiesel says, that God died in the hangman's noose in Auschwitz because he didn't come. And he didn't come because he's not there because there is no such God, or if there is, it's a God of pure cruelty, who would, in part of a theodicy, say, well, sorry, this is part of a divine plan, I can't tell you what it is, but it requires the slaughter of six million innocent people, and tsunamis, and uh, Rwanda, and what's happening in Syria today, etc. 
all part of a divine plan, ours not to reason why. Christ said goodbye to that God on the cross, uh, as did Elie Wiesel in Auschwitz. The question then is, well, what kind of God could come after that God that would nonetheless retain uh, and renew and retrieve what is best in the old God who may come back again in a post theology guise? Yes? Isn't it a misconception to think that God plans for the misery or the happiness? I think so. That's what I'm saying. We've got to let go of that notion of what's called theodicy. I think that's a terrible conception. But it has been held by many for, for thousands of years. And Anathism contests that very view of God, but does not want to concede God to that view. It was, I'm trying to argue with many before and after me, including, I'm listing Jesus Christ on my side here, and the Buddha, and Shiva, and Siddhartha, and as we've seen the one with Abraham here behind me. Um, so I'm not saying anything new, it's there from the beginning, but the tendency to fetishize God as a God of power, might, and theodicy, who plans everything, and who can come and save us from torture, if he, he, big man, alpha God, uh, omega God, um, so chooses, omni God. So it's a challenge to the omni God of omnipotence, of sovereign omnipotence. Which is, I think, Freud and Nietzsche and Marx are right. It's a projection of the human mind. And by letting go of that God in the first A of anatheism, we may open a space for the return of the true God of justice and love. So back to Hopkins. These dark nights of the soul, recorded in his dark sonnets, were for Hopkins interludes on a return journey to the ordinary universe as a place where one might give praise for what he calls speckled, dappled things. Suddenly everything is charged with the divine. There were occasions, they, they were for Hopkins, occasions to re-encounter Christ, not in some timeless heaven, but, quote, in 10,000 places. I'll give the full quote. Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. So limbs, eyes, faces, and the speckled, dappled things of nature become charged with the grandeur of God. He's actually got a poem called God's Grandeur. In another poem, The Wreck of the Hedgeland, the, the Wreck of the Deutschland, that some consider his masterpiece, we witness Hopkins's most dramatic portrait of how a sense of divine abandonment can fold back into a passionate revisiting of the sacred. Here the nadir of deepest descent, catabasis, becomes a second moment of divine ascent, anabasis, a second yes to the no of dereliction. Uh, Hopkins based the poem on the sinking of a ship called the Deutschland, which was carrying a company of uh, German nuns, uh, across the British Channel to England, and they were drowned. And he uh, imagines what goes through the mind of the Reverend Mother as she stands on deck uh, and the ship sinks. And this is what she sings. She was calling, O oh Christ, Christ, come quickly. Is the shipwreck then a harvest? Does tempest carry the grain for thee? For the lingerer with love glides lower than death in the dark, a vein for the visiting of the past prayer pent in prison, our passion plunged giant risen. So the passion plunged giant is Christ, plunged in his passion on the crucifixion, the descent into hell, risen again. So she's calling out uh, in a moment of giving herself again to, uh, to the passion plunged giant who may arise again. Seamus Heaney, the Nobel laureate, the Irish poet, says of Hopkins that in his poems, I quote, the act of love could be read as a faithful imitation of Christ as a sign of grace, insofar as the church fathers perceived the signs of the cross in the figure of a man and a woman displayed. So this is poetics of theoerotics, that the passion 
is the passion of suffering, as when we say Christ's passion, but it's also the passion of Eros, as when uh, the pseudo Dionysius, Dennis the Areopagite, the great Greek church father, uh, described the crucifixion as Eros crucified. Eros hung upon the cross. He refused to make that distinction between agape, a sort of nice, um, sentimental Christian love, versus Eros, which was very often dismissed, until then Freud comes along and tries to rehabilitate it, and the romantic romantic literature, or pornography in its perverse way, Dionysius is saying, no, that's, a, that's a, a ruinous dichotomy to separate Eros and Agape, which happened with Gnosticism in Christianity, and happened with Platonism in Western metaphysics, and then the coming together of Platonism and Gnosticism, which basically turned Christianity as a, as a theology of incarnation, into a theology of excarnation, because it set the word against the flesh, even though, as John <coughs> says in the first chapter isn't it, of his gospel, and the word was made flesh. And the word was made flesh, according to a certain Christian platonic metaphysics, in order to get rid of the flesh, which is the irony of ironies, that the, arguably one of the most carnal religions becomes one of the most excarnal religions. Hence, I would argue, <coughs> the strange and perverse um, alliance between Puritanism and pornography, they're twins, of, uh, twin faces of the same phenomenon. But that's another day's work to which we may return. In Hopkins's poetic testimony to the dark nights of the soul, we witness a bold refiguring of first creation as second creation, of loss and return as passion in the double sense of suffering, abandonment, and eros, return. Here, we witness the recreation of the sacred in the carnal and the profane. We experience, quote, the retrieval of the divine in the flesh and blood of the very least of beings, every, I quote Hopkins, final quote, every jack, poor potsherd, patch, matchwood, is a mortal diamond. Anything, no matter how discarded, remaindered, abject, irrelevant, disabled, every jack, poor potter, patch, matchwood is a mortal diamond. And of course, it seems to me that's what Matthew 25 is saying, uh, namely, when Craig said, I was there and you didn't see me, well, who you were you? I was the stranger. I was the jack, poor, potter, patch, natural, but you didn't see the immortal diamond. Hospice, he repeats the word hospice five times. I was the stranger, the beggar, the, the one you didn't see. It's there, but very often we don't see the secular and the sacred because we're looking somewhere else. We don't see it here, right in front of us. All right, so to conclude this first part of the, of the presentation, um, the poets of the sacred, in the secular, Keats and Hopkins. This is what I would say about Hopkins. Hopkins speaks of poetic epiphany as a retrieval of past experience that moves forward, proffering new life to memory and giving a future to the past. This is why he calls it overing, aftering, seconding, meaning that certain deep experiences can be accompanied by moments of disenchantment and that after this again, we may return to the primal experience in a new light, over and over. As a Jesuit poet, Hopkins is speaking specifically of a certain sacred reimagining. But this notion of sacrament repetition is not confined to the Catholic or any other particular religion. It refers, I suggest, to any poetic movement of returning to God after God. God again after the loss of God. As we learn from child's play, gone, back again, fought, done. I'm taking that from Freud's Beyond the Pleasure Principle, where he observes his grandson, Ernst Freud, who plays with a spool of wool when his mother, Sophie Freud, has to leave and Freud is babysitting. And he knows that the first words uttered by his grandson are fought down in German, meaning gone back again. He's playing with the spool of wool, and as he casts the spool of wool away, he says gone, and as he pulls it back again, he says da, back again. 
And so what he's doing is rehearsing symbolically in words, in child's play, in the shortest story ever told, two words, the coming and going of his mother, which otherwise is an unbearable agony unless turned into a poetics of loss and retrieval. So we learn early how to make the double movement of the double A. And what applies to the loss and retrieval of the mother, our first love object, as psychoanalysis would say, applies also to the loss and retrieval of the divine. We learn young that what disappears as literal comes back again as figural, that is, a sign and symbol, and as presence, a second presence in and through absence. Not very popular to talk about presence after Jacques Derrida and the instruction, but I'm doing it. And symbol here does not mean untrue or unreal. The return of the lost one, in the case of religion, the lost God, may well be one of real presence, sacramentally speaking. It may in fact be much more powerful than moving presence precisely because of its return after and through absence. Like when somebody you love goes away and they come back and they're wonderful. But if they stay, you take them for granted. And there was an old experiment, you know, care, that, you know, if you're having a really bad row with a good friend or a partner or a spouse, it's a very good thought experiment. Imagine them dead Right? And not like I hate you so much, I want you dead, but maybe that's the first move. But then, oh my God, you miss them. You start missing them because suddenly they're gone. And you say, why, well, you know, why wasn't I nicer to that person? Why didn't I listen to them? Why wasn't I more caring? It's a similar kind of phenomenon. Familiarity breeds contempt. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. You know, all these cliches. But there is a certain truth in letting go of something in order to receive it back. It's precisely what Abram had to learn twice in, in Genesis. First, and we'll come to it in a moment, in, in the scene with the strangers. He had to let go of his fears, he had to let go of the tribal god and open his tent to these strangers who walked in out of the desert and give them food. And instead of fighting them as enemies, he receives them as, as guests and friends. It's the same word in all Indo-European languages, Semitic and Indo-European, same word for enemy and guest. In Latin, it's hostis, hence our word hostility, but also hospitality, hostis hospes. So it always had that double, double sense. So he has to let go of the old god of tribal sovereignty and exclusion and receive the strangers into the barren, sterile tent. And only in so doing, in, in making that impossible gesture of peace rather than hostility towards the stranger, uh, does the divine happen, and the impossible becomes possible, namely Sarah becomes pregnant with a child. And the child is called Isaac, which means laughter. Why? Because she roared laughing. Why? Because it was impossible. Me? I'm 99, and my husband is, you know, 800. No way we're having a child. But they were right. They said, we're coming back in nine months, and you will, you will be with the child. When we come back again, you will be with the child. And she is. So Abraham has to let go of that tribal exclusive, exclusive God in order to open to the God of the stranger. So let go of the sovereign God, and then the God after God is the God revealed when the three persons sitting at the table behind me become one. They morph into one, the one God. Uh, and secondly, <clears throat> and not long after that, on Mount Moriah, uh, he has to let go of the God of tribal sacrifice that says, you must love me more than your son. Sacrifice him to me. And of course that was a practice in, in, in most religions of that time, many child sacrifice, which then became animal sacrifice, and blood sacrifice. But it was a periodic bloodletting in order to propitiate the angry, powerful omni-god. If you didn't sacrifice your cattle and indeed your children and your firstborn, then you know all kinds of violence and horrors would be wreaked upon you. So there he troops up, not having learned his lesson. Would you think he'd have learned his lesson under the Mamre tree with the strangers? But no. He troops up to Mount Moriah and is about to sacrifice his son, blood sacrifice, to propitiate this, this god, the expiatory victim to the god of theodicy. 
And another God, after God, comes and says, no. And actually in the Hebrew it's a different name. Elohim is the God who, talk, who asks him to sacrifice his son. And Yahweh is the God who intervenes and says, do not sacrifice your son. So the God after God says, I am a God of mercy, not sacrifice. I seek caritas, love, and justice, not sacrifice. And this, of course, then becomes a very important theme in the prophets, particularly Isaiah, and of course, again, uh, in, 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 in the Christian moment. We'll come to that. All right, so back to Hopkins and brief conclusion. Thus, in the prefix Anna, we find the idea of retrieving, revisiting, reiterating, repeating. But repeating forwards, not backwards. It's not about regressing nostalgically to some prelapsarian past, some golden age when God once was pure, pristine being. And now we've lost it, let's go back, you know, like, like the Vatican conservatives of the evangelical fanatics, the fundamentalists. It's not that. It is going back to go forward. Reculer pour mieux sauter. So it is in this sense that I use the term anatheism as a returning to God after God, the subtitle of my book. A critical hermeneutic retrieval of sacred things that have passed but still bear a radical remainder. An unrealized potentiality or promise to be more fully realized in the future. In this way, anatheism may be understood as after faith which is more than a simple afterthought or after effect. After faith as eschatological, something ultimate, and in the end, that was in fact, sorry, something ultimate in the end that was in fact already there from the beginning. And that is why the after of Anna is also a before. A before that has been transposed into a second after. Okay, that's about as technical as I would get. And now let me move on to the paintings. All right, we'll move smartly. Uh, so, the first painting I've sort of commented on, and I may not um, uh, delay too much longer here, uh, simply to say that you have the three strangers represented as three angels by Chagall in this, in this contemporary, well, 20th century, rendition of Abraham and Sarah on the left bringing the bowl of food to celebrate uh, this uh, act of hospitality, where the enemy hostess becomes the, the guest. And in this inaugural act of hospitality, receiving the enemy into the home, um, Sarah receives a child into her room. Um, after this event, there is a sacred day in Judaism, as some of you may know, called the Sukkot, where, where Jews are invited to create a temporary house or tent in their backyard or somewhere, uh, to remind them that they are nomads, that they are always on the move. They are Abrahamic, who Hegel described as a stranger on the, you know, Psalm 119 described as a stranger on the earth. We are all strangers on the earth. And this is a reminder to the Jewish people that they are people of the tent that move and that open to strangers. That the first three books of the Bible are books based on strangers. The book of Job, the book The Song of Songs, the Shulamite woman is black and beautiful and strange. And Ruth, the Moabite, who of course is the um, ancestor of David, who is in the same lineage as Jesus. If it wasn't for Ruth coming into the tribe from the Moab, the Moabite people, there would have been no David and then no, no Jesus and, and so on. And I say this in no supersessionist sense, you know, that kind of Judaism is preparing for Christianity, which is preparing for Islam, which is preparing for God knows what comes next, the Mormons, which is preparing for the, you know, Dawkins and the New Atheists. I'm not talking about a teleological argument here of, of progress from the primitive to the new. This is the oldest story in the book, um, and yet it, it, it's what comes back, or what should come back as the God after God, this moment of radical hospitality. And in the Passover, 
to remain with the, um, Abra the first Abrahamic religion for a moment, you have the famous prayer, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of the stranger, having yourselves been strangers in the land of Egypt. That's Exodus 22. Uh, and it goes on from there. So, in, um, in Deuteronomy, you actually find 46 uh, exhortations, 36 commands to love the stranger and only two to love your neighbor. Much easier to love the familiar than to love the one who is strange. When you find yourself in the midst of uncertainty, mystery, and doubt, you don't reach for your sword or your gun, you reach your hand out. That's the impossible becoming possible. The, the transfiguration of hostility into hospitality. So that is the ultimate anatheist wager I'm arguing, and now let me move briefly on to the uh, Christian uh, event. So, uh, I'm going to look at uh, two um, enunciations. The first is Botticelli, uh, the uh, Cestello enunciation. And here you have the moment of, I'm arguing, uh, Mary um, uh, being told by the stranger Hospice, do not be afraid as she withdraws and steps back and in the painting as in almost all annunciations you find well actually here you've got the lectern right over on the right and you've got the lily just above the angel's head the lectern representing the fact that, as we're told in Luke, the Gospel of Luke merely ponders uh, and um, is troubled. So the troubling di diatorecti is in her senses. She is carnally troubled, confused. And the lily represents the senses, scent. Right? And then dialogitimai, pondering, uh, is her relationship, her hermeneutic relationship with the text the book, she is one of the people of the book, she's inscribed in a tradition of stories and narratives, which you may wonder, uh, is she reading uh, the moment the stranger enters, is she reading Genesis, where Abraham receives the strangers, and being encouraged by that to receive the stranger, is she reading Jacob meet, meeting Rachel at the well, where Jesus will later meet the Samaritan woman, uh, is she reading Adam and Eve, who are told by the serpent, you shall be as gods, and then they make a big mistake. What's she reading? In any case, she's dialoguing. Dialoguism, I says the Greek. Um, she ponders, right? And she thinks it's not some kind of blind visitation or saturation, as Jean Marion might say. This is an, a, a moment where she is free to say yes or no. And hence, in Botticelli's painting, you see her recoiling and also going forward. She's receiving the stranger and she's also recoiling. So when he says, do not be afraid, it's because, as Rilke says, every angel is terrible. And the first response to the strange is to recoil in fear or to react in a hostile fashion. But here, through her senses, the lily, and her sinking, the book, she makes, her, makes an anatheist wager and says yes to this stranger who is coming back to her. De Denise Levertov, I, I come back to the poets to help us here. We've only got three lines in Luke and practically nothing of any interest in, in two and a half, about 2,000 years of philosophy and theology to get into the mind of Mary. Um, Kierkegaard gets into the mind of Abraham going to Mount Moriah, the famous book called Fear and Trembling, but we have nothing but painters and poets to help us get into the mind of Mary, or Jesus, or Paul, or whatever. I'm just resting with the Christian woman for now. So here is Denise Levertov describing this scene in her poem, The Annunciation. We know the scene, the room variously furnished, almost always a lecture and a book, always the tall lily. Arrived on the solemn grandeur of great wings, the angelic ambassador, standing or hovering, whom she acknowledges a guest. Hostess. Hospice. But we are told of meek obedience. No one mentions courage. The engendering spirit did not enter her without consent. God waited. She was free to 
accept or to refuse, choice integral to humans. So Mary's faced here with a waiter, with a choice. She looks up from her lectern and reads the face of the stranger. She chooses to say yes, carnally, courageously, and word is made flesh. Another poet, Andrew Hutchins, glossing Botticelli's Castello painting here behind me, offers this variation on the scene. I quote, Angel to virgin, both her hands held up, both elegant, one raised as if to say stop, while the other hand, the right one, reaches towards his, and as it does, it parts her blue robe and reveals the concealed red of her inner garment to the red tiles of the floor and the red folds of the angel's robe. But her whole body pulls away, only her head, already haloed, bows, acquiescing. And though she will, she's not yet said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. As Botticelli, in his great pity, lets her refuse, accept, refuse, and think again. And the thinking again, the turning again, back again anew, is the Anna. This is the moment of Anna. Now I think the term thinking, as in Luke 1, 26, Mary was troubled and pondered, is important here, the pondering. Because all too often we, we ignore that moment of freedom to interpret, which Mary has in the moment of recall before she consents. She is no pa passive victim or manipulandum of some divine will for good or evil. Any more than Judas had to do what he did, Mary doesn't have to do what she did. And if she hadn't said yes, there wouldn't be Christianity. It was for the human to say yes or no to the sacred call of the stranger. I want to come finally to but before I do, I want to have a look at one more enunciation and then come finally to Andre Rubio's uh, Trinity. But let me stay with the second enunciation, which I'm particularly fond of. It's by Antonio de Massima, a Sicilian painter, and uh, it is of another version of the enunciation, but this time without any adornments, without a visible stranger, all we get is a face-to-face -face with the Nazarina, as I call her, for reasons I will explain. This painting has been given humanist atheist readings. It's called the Annunciata, so it is the Annunciation, as well as Christian uh, sacred readings. It can go either way, and that's what I find interesting. And if you look, the painting is split down the middle. And I will now offer this gloss on this particular image to illustrate that point of Mary as she is troubled and pondered. A strange annunciation, just the woman, no angel, foreground without background, no doves, no rays of light, no columns, no lilies, no celestial sky or shimmering halo, just her and us. At the moment, the painting, Antonella de Massimus, powerfully embodies Luke's phrase about the, the girl at Nazareth. She was troubled and pondered. Here she ponders, just look at her face, in two minds between yes and no. Trasi et Nessi, as they say in Sicily, where the painting was realized and hangs today in the Palazzo Abatellus in Palermo. She hovers still on the threshold passing to and fro, hither and thither, fore and aft. Just look at the line running from the top of her blue mantle along the bridge of her nose, straight down the V of her shawl, through the knuckles of her hand to that light dark dividing edge of the lectern. The lectern with its two sides, one illuminated, one shadowed, bearing the book with the lifted page opening and closing 
in what I call an anatheist instinct. What was she reading? And why must it wait, suspended in midair, as she responds to the word that now calls her in the flesh from writing to touch, from parchment to skin? Infinitesimal suspension, mirroring in turn her hands, one opening towards the viewer, us, the painter, Gabriel, the angel, the stranger who calls, the other hand closing her mantle, protecting, hiding, withholding. Touch if you can and look at those eyes, those eyes that put Mona Lisa to shame, averted as they ponder, the right withdrawing into shade as the left brightens slowly, maybe, into a smile of yes. Messiness and Anciata invites each viewer to be the Angelus, the messenger from afar, the visitor, stranger, seducer. We witness the Nazarene's witness, her sheer humanity as it breaks into divinity, oscillating between light and shadow, declining and consenting. I call her the Nazarena because Mary is too late. She has left her old self behind, and Madonna is too soon. She has not yet conceived. The Nazarene's ambidextrous response to the call, to host the guest, to consent to love, to touch the untouchable, to welcome the stranger, is our condition too. We also hover, don't we, between human and divine, between belief and disbelief. We also dwell in that moment of Anna, where the first day of adieu, withdrawing, abstaining, absenting, passes through the Nazarene's flesh into the second day of adieu, opening up, searching out, reaching out, arriving. Suspended between the double A of Abdeo and Ad Deo, the two adieus, hovering in the time of the now, the space of the here, the N at the heart of Anna is the Nazarena herself, in flesh and blood, in cloth and book, in hands and eyes and mouth and nose and neck and look. She is the N of the nook, the now, between before and after, inhabiting the space between here and there. She dwells amongst us between the two ends of already and advent, the now of the Nazarena. So finally, I want to say a word before a brief conclusion about my final image, which is, whoops, is okay, there we go. Uh, the Perichoresis by Andrei Rubiev, uh, great Russian Orthodox icon maker, whose trinity was proclaimed the canonical work of the Greek Orthodox religion in 1600, what St. Thomas became for the Western Scholastic Catholic Church. Uh, the trinity, this icon became for the for the Eastern. Interesting, they chose an image rather than a text of philosophy. Um, but what we have here are, of course, the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but represented as the three strangers that come to Abraham, the three angels. And they are uh, sitting at a table, in fact, moving, according to the title, perichoresis, which I'll come back to in a moment, which means moving around, it's in peri, and choresis, the chora, around. Uh, they are sitting around, moving around a chalice. And the chalice is the chalice of Sarah, offered to uh, the three strangers when they appear under the Mamre tree in Genesis. It's also the chalice of the Last Supper. It's also the chalice of a mouse, where in the inn, Jesus and the disciples break bread after the crucifixion. So it's, uh, it's a trinity that returns to previous trinities. Abraham's, Abraham and Sarah's three strangers, the three magi that come to, to witness the birth, the coming, the advent of the Lord, uh, the three strangers at Emmaus, well, Jesus and the two, but in many of the icons they're portrayed in exactly this arc of the three persons. And it is finally and eschatologically the three persons of the Christian Trinity. But interestingly, in the term perichoresis, the Greek, um, 
you have in it the, the idea of they're moving, they're in movement. They're not, they're not as, it's not a static uh, being that is identical with itself and, and, and coincident with itself, subsisting in itself. It is moving around the Kora, and the Kora is the womb, the chalice, the gap, the open space, the ana, at the center of their movement. In Latin, excuse the linguistics here, but it's important, it's translated as circum and chessio. Circum, around, is it circumference? In chessio, spelt with an S or a, or a C. When spelt with a C, and this is deconstruction, you know, 2,000 years before its time, or 1,000 years before its time, spelt with a C, it's chedo, that each of the persons is ceding the place, giving the place to the other, saying, after you. No, your place, your place, you be my guest. Right? So the host is ceding the place to the guest. Father to son, son to spirit, spirit to father, and so on, ad infinitum. Sado is you take your place as offered. You take the empty space. So the, the movement is a constant dance around. The circumcessio was a dance around. The perichoresis is a dance around the center, the space that is opened up by the womb. And interestingly, in several of the uh, murals and mosaics and icons of the Greek Orthodox, uh, the early Greek Orthodox Church, you have representations of the Madonna, of Mary, with the child, the infant child, in her womb, in her heart, and it is called the Kora Akoraton. Mary is called the container, the Kora, of the Akoraton, that which cannot be contained. So she is the chalice that receives the stranger. The stranger being, in all instances, the, the divine. Um, the sacred stranger. Now, I didn't turn that off, so that's a hint that it's time to have done with the images. And um, move to a quick conclusion, because I promised I'd come in whoops, on, under, um, under uh, 50 minutes. All right, so let me, let me conclude with a brief uh, few paragraphs and then I'd be very happy to take any questions you have. The moments of poetic imagination depicted in these poems and paintings do not necessarily entail faith or a second faith in some divine other. I'm simply observing that it may well serve, that they may well serve, for those who choose, as a prelude to such a second faith, an anna faith. While not requiring religious belief, a poetic openness to the gracious and the strange does open up what Jeet calls this disposition to receive, this disponibilité, this disposition à la carte, which may also serve to remind us that any religion worth its salt needs art if it is to be true to faith. For art reveals that religions are anthropomorphic, composed of human images, names, stories, and symbols. In short, poetics reminds us, whether it's literary poetics or whether it's visual poetics, reminds us that religions are, in a very significant way, imaginary works, even when they witness, even when what they witness to, is claimed to be transcendent and true. Mindful of the inherent art of religion, we are more likely, I think, to resist the temptations of fetishism, fundamentalism, and idolatry. That is, avoid taking the divine literally as something we could presume to contain or possess. The figural saves God from the literal. For faith is not just the art of the impossible, but an art of endless hermeneutics, endless interpretation. Spiritual art may thus teach us that the second, sorry, that the sacred stranger can never be taken for granted, can never be reduced to a collective acquisition, but needs to be interpreted again and again, offering, overing, seconding. Yet another modern poet, W. H. Auden, puts this well in respect to his own Christian anatheism when he says, every Christian has to make the transition from the child's we believe still to the adult's I believe again. This cannot have been easy to make at any time, and in our age, he says, it is really rarely made, it would seem, without a hiatus of unbelief.
pass through a moment of unbelief, uncertainty and doubt, mystery before returning, if we so choose, to belief. But this is a dialogue, a very open and creative dialogue with open atheism. It's a call to a dialogue between open atheism and open theism. That's the space of atheism, which both precedes the division. It's before, you go back before the position of atheism or theism. That's why it's a disposition, preliminary, inaugural disposition, predisposition. And it's also what comes after. Anna is what is before, back, and after in you. Auden adds tellingly that while the liturgy says we in the confession of our shared responsibility for the sins of our neighbours, in the creed it says credo, I believe, not credimus, we believe, for nobody can put the responsibility of his faith upon others. By including poetics, or the religious imagination, as a special arena of anatheist experience, I do not mean to equate the anatheist wager with fiction, as if it's untrue, unreal, a mere fantasy. It, au contraire, if poetics invites a willing suspension of first belief and disbelief, it neither includes nor excludes a leap of second faith. It may rather be said to clear a landing site for the divine stranger without either prohibiting a particular landing or mandating a particular landing. The poetical as if may, as noted, serve as a powerful prelude to faith for those who choose to see the stranger as God, but the choice is a free one. I believe that without some poetic release into a free variation of possibility that poetics allows, the return to God after God is virtually impossible. And the important thing in the heel of the hunt is that clearances Spaces, choras, stand open so that pure change may happen and the stranger may return. Thank you. So we have some time, I think, for questions. Comments? Many, many, many. Mm, I'm not sure who was up first. We'll do one, two, three. Yes. Hi, um, Robert Pennington, doctoral student from St. Thomas University, and I'm saying what's in this regards to. Um, I was hoping you could speak a little bit more about religion and the relationship between anarchy and atheism and that concept and Michael Hayes' book, Atheism and Religion. Yeah. Um, and then also, I'm curious to know if you can talk about the Catholic passage. Um, you're talking about the fourth reduction. And so we call it a micro eschatology. Remind ourselves that we are seeking to signpost a path that brings us back to the end, eschaton, that is after the capital of the end, telos, and before the beginning, the arch. In eschatology, that restores us to the simplicity of the face to face prior to all first causes and final causes. We are talking in our reports formula about an eschatology of the sacred, both in archaeology and teleology. In other words, in our eschatology of the everyday defies the perverse reading of eschatology in some triumphant end. Okay, well, I suppose anatheism is a very simple way of saying micro eschatology. Gosh, don't I use terrible words? <laughs> <laughs> so, I wonder if anybody still sitting in this room. But anyway, um, it's like you know, Heidegger says, and I'm not claiming to be Heidegger, can I assure you, on any front. But he says, when in the preface to Being in Time, he said, you know, people are going to have terrible difficulty reading this work um, because I'm inventing all these new words and whatnot. But he said, remember, when Aristotle wrote the physics and Plato wrote the Protagoras, the Greeks didn't understand what the hell he was, they were saying either. And now we kind of, 2,000 two years later, we're beginning to understand what they're saying. Anyway, that's all by way of apologizing for these jawbreakers. Um, but sometimes you do need a new term. Now, micro-eschatology was important for me in terms of the micro, because eschatology, as I'm sure most of you know, is the, doc is the doctrine, the, the thinking about final things. And usually the final things are considered what happens at the end of time, what happens when you get to heaven, and they're very much macro, you know, capitalized things. The kingdom, the being, 
a second coming, but always capitalized. Whereas in the, in the Abrahamic story that says God is the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, or in the Christian story which says I am every stranger, right? And I was every stranger because before Abraham was, I am. What Jesus is doing is he's saying goodbye to the macro eschatology and hello, adieu, to the micro, that it's in the least of these. The divine is in the alakistos, the least of these. Not the greatest of these, but the least of these. And that's the first will be last and so on. It goes, unless the grain dies, you know, it cannot be reversed. Um, so it's really almost, micro eschatology is almost a contradiction in terms, but I think it's the truth that the kingdom is in the now, and the now is in our openness to the strange. In everything that is there before us. Or the stranger in everybody who is there before us, including the person we think we know best in the world. And if that isn't our partner, or brother, or sister, or spouse, or whatever, our best friend, it's ourselves. You know, it's because we are strangers to ourselves. And I love Walter Benjamin's phrase about what he calls a weak messianism. <coughs> He says we, we should consider every instant of our lives as a portal through which the Messiah may enter. That it's already there. It's always still to come because it's always strange, but it's always already there. And that kind of splitting of every instant into a moment of wonder and openness and just, I mean, if only we could live like that, we would be living messianic. <coughs> It would be a time of, of messianic peace. Um, so that's really the idea that I'm bringing it into the everyday, that the eternal traverses the now, the moment. That's why I call the Nazarene, the end of the Nazarene, the now. That moment is the divine. You don't have to wait till the end of history. I mean, the nice thing about the end of history is that what it allows for in terms of a human narrative of what the divine is, is a sense that all the divine moments that happen at any moment uh, can somehow be recapitulated in the memory of God. And that's a beautiful idea. Right? And that the evil that is done it disappears like chaff. Right? It is not remembered. That's hell, if you like. It's the non-remembering, uh, the consigning to nothing of, uh, of evil things. So there is, there is a sense of justice about it. But that can happen as, a, as a, 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 an anthropomorphic story, an image. And the perigresis I've shown, all the poems and all the, they're all images. That's all we have. And the poets and the painters, I think, get better than the theologians and the philosophers. Because we philosophers and theologians sometimes forget that we're imagining things. When we say trinity, or we say first cause, or we say, you know, um, all these, you know, theological and ontological words, they're, they're creations of our imagination. So the micro-eschatology is getting back to the, to the divine in the smallest of things. It's the God of little things as opposed to the God of great things. So it's, 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 de it's bringing God into the lower case, always, which is what happens, it seems to me, when these strangers appear, these beggared strangers appear starving out of nowhere. That's the hospice, right? and that's God. When a child appears in a manger with animals, that's God. And we're looking somewhere else all the time. So anyway, that's a long way of answering your question. I hope that helps. And we talk, we talk more after, I hope. Sorry, you're next. Yes. First of all, thank you for that lovely talk. Thank you.
Well, it's a great question, and um, interestingly, myself and Lossi are doing a little book together on the and his, his response to it and mine. So very similar in many respects, but where we differ, and you've kind of put your finger on it, is he spent so much time with Derry Dam, who was one of his best friends, and Derry wrote a beautiful book on Lossi's notion of the touche to touch, but that he stresses all the time the unworkable nature, the impossible nature. Right? Uh, as for Derry Dam, you know, forgiveness is impossible, pardon is for gospel. Possible. Justice is impossible. We must still seek it, but it's impossible. Whereas I put the emphasis on the possibility. And in my book, and whenever I think about these things or talk about it, I always give examples. And I see it working all the time. I see it as incredibly workable. Right? It, that doesn't mean it's not difficult. It is the impossible becoming possible, but I see that possibility happening everywhere. No see sees it happening nowhere. Well, it does. And in fact, his books, I've been teaching, you know, his wonderful books, Corpus, uh, one and two, two has just come out last month. But it, they're, they're almost unteachable. They're, they're beautiful books, but try teaching them, I'm telling you. Try reading them. <laughs> and try understanding them. But because it's so, what he's getting at, it's, it's true. I mean, I think what he's getting at is true, but it's just so hard. Now, you know, here am I talking, and I'm coming up with microeschatology and anatheism. So, um, but what I try to do, you know, when I talk about it and when I write about it, is give examples. So, in anatheism, for example, I talk about Dorothy Day, about John Vanier, about Gandhi, and you know, Bonhoeffer and Eddie Hillison, people who do that and do it all the time. And it's not just the great saints. I mean, it's the little saints who are everywhere. And that's not to say, you know, to be uh, candid about it and, 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 and turn your back on evil. I mean, you just have to walk down the street to see injustice and poverty and um, inequality and meanness. So, but it's a, in the midst of that, there are all these miracles of the impossible becoming possible. And um, that's where I differ from Nancy. It, I, I talk about that more. That doesn't mean I'm, I think it's more workable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think opens the door. It does. This context making right. like, you know, the concentration camp is particularly inaccessible yeah. to all of what's happening. Yeah. So then what about the fire? What about the various kinds of situations yeah. which yeah. Uh, but for you, mm -hmm. we can sort of consciously go, I want to participate. Yes. I want to make it. Yeah. And I may be wrong about that, but that's I take that leap. For better or for worse. Okay, thank you. And you had a question, I think, thirdly, and then I'll try and be quicker actually in responding. I'll be very quick. No, no. Thank you for coming up very My, my instinct is to say absolutely, you know, if they are the new strangers, the new scapegoats, the new, you know, horrors, then, then yes, let, let's try and bring them to the table and, and see what, what they're doing and what they're saying. I don't actually know the religion, so you know, I'm, I'm maybe a bit ignorant. Um, but it seems to me, um, I mean, you know, child sacrifice, animal sacrifice, I'm not sure my instinct, certainly on the former, would be there's some things that are non-negotiable. So to sit down and say, okay, you sacrifice your children to God, well, 
maybe you're right. I, I couldn't go that far, and I'm not suggesting. You know, I'm, I'm just saying that I'm, that's hyperbole. Um, sacrifice of animals, I have difficulty with too. But again, you know, one has to look at the anthropology and see what's happening there and what's being intended there. What if there's a in the world? Yeah. Specifically, Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and who am I to judge the way Muslims or Jews uh, bleed animals to eat them and make it kosher? Or, uh, you know, is it any worse to bleed an animal to save a life? Save a life? Exactly. So, um, you know, anatheism is not a new religion, it's just a way of being open to what may come. And I think it's a very interesting point. I, I remember I was talking to some pastors recently in the uh, liberal Protestant theology group in, in Strasbourg, and one of the pastors was saying to me that one of the greatest difficulties she had in church was accepting that somebody from the Nouvelle Droite, you know, the, the right wing, could actually have goodness in them, you know? It's kind of easy, you know? It's easy to be, to be open to the stranger when they're like you, and they agree with you, but when they don't agree with you, then is there, you know, how do you see that there's something in them that is redeemable? Yeah, it's very hard. It's very hard, particularly if that blood has killed your loved ones. But it happened in Northern Ireland, you know, Jerry Adams um, and Ian Paisley, the two leaders of hate, shook hands and became Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, these things. Um, another, Mr. Ennis, his daughter was bombed by the IRA and, and he forgave them and, and shook their hands and that was an impossible act. You know, an impossible act. It's actually a scene in that influenced me a lot when I was started talking about hospitality. It was in Ireland in the in the 15th century. The Fitzgeralds and the Ormonds were involved in this blood feud, and they were killing each other. There was a civil war going on, and eventually the Fitzgeralds had cornered the Ormonds in Dublin Cathedral, and they were, you know, starving them out. And eventually, uh, Fitzgerald said, "This is this is absolutely ridiculous. This has going, been going on for centuries. We've got to put a stop to it." So what he said was to Lord Ormond, he said, cut a hole in the door and I'll put my arms through and shake your hand. So he hasn't taken bench, he cut a hole in the door, which is still there if you ever go to Dublin Cathedral, you can see it there, Christ Church Cathedral. And he, put his, he took off his armour and he put in his bare arm and it could have been cut off, but the gesture was such a vulnerability to the enemy that they shook hands and that was the end of the war. But sometimes you have to do the impossible for that to happen, and maybe sometimes talking to those of another religious persuasion, which you consider impossible, uh, may well be the beginning of something very important. So thank you for the question. Yes, I think, and then somebody back there, yes, and then you. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be quicker. If I find out I take three questions, so people get the questions in, and then I'll see how I can respond. Because you want to close shop soon, yeah? Oh no, that's alright, don't worry about me.
first admit? Climate change, open space for something else that may happen, a hubris, you know, kind of a puncturing of our hubris that we've imposed this on nature, and our scapegoating nature. Um, but in fact, 
what climate change, change is teaching us is that the best laid plans you know, of mice and men. And yes, uh, it can open a space. Now that can be read either apocalyptically, let the whole world crumble and then maybe God will return. And I don't particularly like that thinking. And that's where I slightly disagree with Derrida. You know, but that I like to see it, that we work with little things. But, but at planetary level, I think there's a real truth in what you're saying, and that there's an opportunity there for it. As Holderlin said, where, is the, where there is the greatest danger, there there is the greatest salvation. So, yes to that. Uh, the Holocaust, yes. I think the first instinct is to say we cannot speak about it. And Adorno was right to say, after Auschwitz, who can write poetry? A landsman, who can make movies? Uh, who can say anything? But as Levinas said, if we go on being silent, then the Nazis have won. Because they wanted to get rid of all the records and that nobody would speak about it. So in a way, you may be honoring the horror by not speaking, because it's unspeakable. But also, then you're not bearing witness. And that's why Primo Levi said, I have to write about it. I have to speak about it so that it does not happen again. So that I honor my debt to the dead by remembering them. But yet the first instinct should be, no, I can't speak about it, it's unspeakable, and then I try to speak about it, impossible and all as that is. Third point, uh, poetry, yeah, just, just like I don't think the poets did know what the painters were thinking, but you're, so that's a quick answer to that. The, 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 the example from Gandhi is very beautiful, and it's exactly right, that's the impossible becoming possible, that's the wager. And the invitation comes from Gandhi, but it's up to the, his friend, who wants him to eat, uh, to go and do that act. Uh, the divine is always, and there Gandhi is God, you know, who is... He was a stranger, he was not a friend. Well, there you go. Yeah. Exactly. So it's in terms of the stranger. And lastly, um, very interesting question, uh, we could spend hours on it if we had time. Um, anatheism is not a, a, a question of believing or not believing, in fact. I want to try and get away from that, you know, that God, do I believe that God exists as kind of a, a proposition of knowledge. Anatheism is a position of not knowing, and therefore of trust. Faith is trust, fidens, fiancé, you know, it's kind of a nuptial engagement with someone, something, everything that's there, rather than uh, let me decide with proofs and demonstrations and arguments whether God exists or not. And that's where kind of theism and atheism has got bogged down a bit, I think. It becomes too much a question of knowledge. Now, if one goes for the notion of faith as trust and fian fiancé, fiancé, there is in that kind of a blood I wouldn't say blind, but, you know, not knowing. There's a certain, you don't know. Like when you commit yourself to somebody, you don't know what's going to happen, but you take the leap.